So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. And in the uh, next 20 minutes or so, I will try to give you an overview of uh, the focus of my uh, interest and my research uh, for the past uh, four and a half years, including uh, during the last two years uh, in my pr present uh, uh, position as a senior researcher at the immunology department at the Weizmann. Now, as a physician um, dealing with uh, internal medicine and gastroenterology, and also as a researcher, I spent a lot of time and put a lot of emphasis on our gastrointestinal tract, which, uh, as you know, is an amazing organ, which is critically important for our digestion, but also has many other important functions. The gastrointestinal tract is also central in many uh, common diseases, such as inflammation, infection, and cancer. However, in my medical and research uh, uh, period, I completely overlooked a very important function of the gastrointestinal tract, and not only I overlooked it, my entire colleagues uh, for the past 70 years of uh, uh, gastrointestinal medicine and research have completely overlooked this important function. Um, and this function is that our gastrointestinal tract hosts a world of microorganisms, which includes trillions of bacteria of thousands of different kinds, but also hundreds of different kinds of viruses, fungi, and parasites that live together with each other and with us throughout our life and form a complete ecosystem that is fundamentally important for almost every aspect of our physiology and our existence. Now, they say that one photo is uh, worth a thousand words. So for me, this is the photo. This is a scanning electron microscopy which actually describes what we all look from the inside. And what you can see here in a healthy human being are those bumps, those heels, which actually represent our lining epithelium, which covers our gastrointestinal tract. You can also see that above it, there is a carpet of what looks like shoelaces. And these are the trillions of bacteria that live within each and every one of us. And we call them the microbiota. Now, when we look even closer, this is 160,000 fold magnification. You can see that some of these bacteria actually penetrate into our body, penetrate into our cells. So you can already imagine the intimacy and the complexity of the interaction between our internal bacteria and our own self. In the last few years, we've experienced some technological breakthroughs, such as uh, the development of next generation sequencing that allow us for the first time to look at this very complex world within a world. And when we did this, we found something that is absolutely striking. When we count our internal bacteria, we found that the number of our bacteria is greater 10 times more than the numbers of our human cells. When we count the genes of our internal bacteria, the number of genes of our bacteria is a thousandfold greater than the total number of our human genes, which means that each and every one of you here in this room is in fact 90 to 99% bacteria by any scientific standard. <laughs> and this also means, and we've learned this in the, couple, in the last couple of years, that in order to really understand this complex machine that called, that's called the, the human body, we need to consider the entire package, including our human side, but also our microbial side. Now, the field of the study of our gut microbes, or the microbiota, has only been revived seven years ago. And it revived with a striking observation by, by a clinician from St. Louis named Jeff Gordon, which performed a very simple experiment which really shocked the world. And what he did was very simple. He took mice that are genetically obese. These mice have a gene uh, missing in them. Actually, this gene was discovered here in the Rockefeller uh, University and he took regular lean mice. And he took from each of these mice their gut microbes, their microbiota, and transferred them into specialized recipient mice that we call germ-free mice, which are mice that are housed in special isolators and are completely sterile. They have no, guts, uh, no gut microbes within them, they have no microbes on their skin, they're completely sterile. And when he did this, he saw something extremely interesting. When he transferred the gut microbes from the thin mice into the sterile mice, they maintained their normal weight. However, when he transferred the microbes from the obese mice into the sterile mice, within a two-week period, they doubled their weight. Okay, so imagine yourself doubling your weight after just two weeks just 
after replacing some of your gut microbes. Of course, this observation was met with a lot of uh, criticism and even ridicule, which in our world means that it was true. Um, <laughs> and, and I can tell you that it's true because just a few months ago, in a follow-up paper, the same exact concept was shown in humans. And in this work, um, a group took pairs of human twins, some of which were identical twins, but these twins were special because one of the twins was very obese and the other was very lean. And the gut microbes were taken from each of these twins and transferred into germ-free mice. And exactly as we saw in mice, the mice that received the gut microbes from the obese twin gained twice as much weight within a few weeks as compared to mice that were uh, transferred with the, uh, with the lean twin, uh, uh, the lean human twin. So this proved to us that our microbiota is actually a very important regulator of our physiology, including our metabolism and other aspects. Now, these earlier observations that were only made six or seven years ago led to a revival of a field and a lot of research, including research from our group, that found that the microbiota has multiple physiological um, effects, some of which are completely unexpected. And these include um, effect on our immune system, on our nutrition, which I will touch upon a little later, on our development, on our metabolism, on our brain function, on our reproduction, and even on our mating preferences. Now, this has been so far shown only in uh, fruit flies, but we are such avid believers in bugs that we believe that this may be also true in humans. Now, the contribution of our group to the field relates to the interaction between our internal microbes and our inner self, our human side. And if you think about it, we have trillions of potentially harmful bacteria that live just one cell layer away from our completely sterile inner self. So, by theory, we all should have been dead right after we were born from sepsis, from, from our infection. Now, this is not the case because in parallel to the evolution of our microbiota, we evolved a very complex immune system that is there to ensure that our microbes get what they need, but also ensures that if something wrong happens and they try to penetrate, a very aggressive reaction prevents this. Now, this extreme symbiosis means that our host, that we, need to have molecular mechanisms that sense and regulate our own bugs. And to make a very long story short, we were able to discover the first such molecular sensing mechanism, which is called an inflammasome, and to demonstrate that it's critically involved in host regulation of how our microbiota functions and how it looks like. Now, mice that are deficient in this new mechanism develop a striking uh, uh, alteration in the composition and the function of their internal bugs. You can see here, for ex an example, uh, uh, transmissive electron microscopy, in which you see these evil-looking bugs that now emerge and proliferate and get to places within our gut that they're not supposed to be in, and this is, uh, in, in essence, uh, our discovery. Now, this platform allowed us to study for the first time the very early events that lead to the development of some very important human multifactorial disease. One of the diseases that are still the focus of um, uh, work in my lab is an autoinflammatory or autoimmune disease, uh, which you may have heard of. It's called inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it has some variants, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Um, it's an emerging disease. We really do not know what causes this disease. But we and others have discovered that impaired interaction between our gut microbes and our human cells is at the very basis of the pathogenesis that causes susceptibility to this disease. You can see here an example for one of our studies in which mice that have normal microbiota were induced with a, a inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see this is the, the wall of their intestine. They develop a mild disease. You can see here an ulcer which characterizes this disease. You can see here a colonoscopy in these mice which we performed, and it's virtually normal. It's trans the, the wall is transparent. You can see some blood vessels. This is stool. But when you do the same exact experiment in the same exact mice, but only change their gut microbes to gut microbes that promote inflammation, you can see that the entire wall of their intestine is vir virtually destroyed. It's infiltrated with immune cells. And when you perform colonoscopy in these mice, their entire wall of their intestine is heavily inflamed and heavily damaged. Now, this new system also allowed us to study some other 
human relevant burning questions in the field. And I think one of the most interesting diseases or groups of diseases that are at the center of our attention right now is um, um, a, a syndrome which we call the metabolic syndrome. And this is a syndrome which um, um, uh, combines um, a very uh, high prevalent diseases such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, um, hypertension, and this actually is the worst world epidemic in the history of mankind. And this all, all, only occurred in the last 100 years, so we know it's, a, it's not a genetic predisposition that causes this outbreak of this uh, amazing uh, epidemic. We know it's an environmental factor, but we don't know what this environmental factor is. And we uh, uh, postulated that perhaps the differences in our gut microbes contribute to the emergence of different components of this disease. So in a work that we uh, published just a year uh, and a half ago, we indeed could decipher in animal models the dysregulation of our microbiota, of our, uh, of our bugs, and their interaction with our host human cells is at the basis of the pathogenesis of some components of the metabolic syndrome, including obesity, including fatty liver, and including type 2 diabetes. And if I just mention fatty liver, this is the most common liver disease in the world. We have only in the US more than 100 million people affected by this disorder. We have absolutely nothing to offer them. We, we have no, no cure or no treatment to offer them. And a large minority of them progress to progressive liver disease, including cirrhosis. And we have found that the, the composition of their gut microbes is a central driver of this disease, and in fact can be at some times transmitted between individuals upon transfer of their gut bacteria. We also looked into cancer, and we found that in some cases, cancer can be regulated by the composition and function of our microbiota. You can see here an example of a colonoscopy performed in mice that harbor a normal microbiota. This is an early stage of a, a disease that we induced in these mice, and we induced colorectal cancer, a very uh, a prevalent disease also in humans, and you can see that tumors just start to be formed in these mice. At the same stage, if we perform the same exact experiment, but this time we put into these mice disease-causing microbiota or different uh, configurations of the microbiota, you can see that we have huge tumors that already has, have the potential to metastasize. So also cancer can be regulated by our gut microbes. And you've heard yesterday from Ravid that even the response to chemotherapy can be very significantly affected by the function of our internal uh, uh, bugs. So I hope that by now I've conveyed to you my vision that we should regard our microbiota as this neglected organ that has been neglected for over 150 years of modern science and in fact has very important uh, effects on many uh, common multifactorial diseases such as allergy, diabetes, obesity, hepatitis, brain disease. We are now studying uh, in this context Alzheimer's disease. We're studying uh, with others autism and we see in everywhere we look very surprising, very important findings and uh, atherosclerosis and you name it. Now the mission of my lab is to take all of these uh, diseases or some of these diseases and study them in depth. So the bacteria in each disease are different, the mechanisms leading to disease susceptibility are different, are different and this is what we have to study. And we are aiming at reaching a mechanistic understanding of host microbiota interactions. We are trying to find out the factors by which our microbes affect our human cells, the factors by which our human cells regulate our microbes, and how impaired interactions lead to a propensity to uh, common multifactorial diseases, and with all the insights that we gain, our final um, uh, strategic aim is to reach principles that would allow the development of microbiota-mediated disease treatment. Now, in the last part of my talk, I would like to devote a few uh, minutes to treatment, because I think this perhaps is the coolest part of microbiota research. Now, our human genome is very important, so I'm I'm not saying that our human genome is not important. You've heard great talks yesterday about its role in cancer. The problem with our human genome is that we are born with it and we will die with it and we have absolutely no ways to change it. So if we have susceptibility, we have to deal with it. In contrast, the genes of our internal microbes, which we call the second genome, are in many cases as important as our first human genome. But in contrast to our human genome, 
we can modulate them, we can change them, we can intervene, and by that change, disease susceptibility. Now, you've heard of ways by which we try to intervene with the composition and function of our microbiota. For example, for 30 years, we've all been trying to take probiotics. I'm sure all of you have tried in some point or other to take probiotics. To say the truth, so, so what's, what's probiotics? Probiotics are bacteria, commensal bacteria that some company is making, and we're taking them in order to try and modulate our own microbiota. And to say the truth, um, if you look at the medical evidence, uh, we've practically failed in all our attempts to use probiotics um, as treatment modulating the microbiota. You may have also heard of a recent, uh, a new way to, to change the microbiota. It's called fecal transplantation. And it's been uh, going on in the, next, in the last year and a half. We now have uh, started to do this in Israel. And in this method, we are trying to aggressively replace the entire community of our gut microbes by giving ourselves uh, a, sam a sample from another human being. So this sounds very aggressive. It is a very aggressive and perhaps very disgusting, but in some, uh, <laughs> but in some instances, it's actually very helpful. So in uh, some distinct hospital-acquired infections that are lethal to many, many people, this approach has proven in high percentage, over 90%, to be life-saving. However, I believe that this approach would not be the silver bullet for intervening in the microbiota. It's aggressive, it's disgusting, it's, it will never be readily available to many people, to many diseases. So we, at, in my group and at the Weizmann, are trying to find more elegant, personalized <laughs> <laughs> ways to, uh, to intervene and to find microbiota-related um, uh, treatments. And I would like to tell you about one of our approaches. And we call this the Personalized Nutrition Project. And what we do, and, and this project is done in close collaboration with my good friend and colleague, uh, Eran Segal, a computational biologist from the Weizmann Institute. And what, what we're trying to do here is to use nutrition, which we and others have found is the greatest driver that um, uh, modulates and regulates the composition and function of our microbiota. In fact, if we change our nutrition and measure uh, by sequencing the changes in our microbiota, as early as one day after a change in nutrition, we can reproducibly change the composition and the function of our gut microbes. So why not use this approach in order to try and modulate our gut microbes as a way to treat disease? And we've decided to focus on the same world epidemic that I've described to you before, this metabolic syndrome, which as you can see here is, is a staggering disease, really. It's, it's, there are billions of people now affected by this. We have no treatment. Uh, even financially, the burden that, that we're already experiencing in trying to treat this huge amount of population um, um, is almost unbearable. And we're trying to apply um, very advanced, uh, uh, unique mechanisms in order to use nutrition to modulate it. Now, we've decided to focus on the regulation of blood glucose, of blood sugar, because blood sugar is a central component in our regulation of weight, our regulation of, of our, our susceptibility to diabetes, and even is related to prevention of cancer, as you've heard yesterday. Now, what happens if we all want to regulate our weight and our blood glucose? What do we all do? We go on a diet, right? And what happens when we go on a diet? What happens when we go on a diet? In over 95% of cases, we completely fail. In fact, there are studies showing that after a year of dieting, we usually gain more weight than we started off. Now, for many years, we blamed ourselves, but actually, if you look at the evidence, most people are pretty compliant with their diet, and still they fail. And one of the reasons that we all fail in dieting is a fact that, that was not really studied, which tells us that if we take, for example, four different people, and we give them an identical food, let's say uh, a piece of white bread, and we measure their blood glucose, these four people will each have a very different response to the same food that we give them, okay? And this tells you that the notion that one size fits all, that we can take one diet, Atkins diet or any other diet, and apply it to the major population and expect that we will all benefit from it, it's completely wrong. It may benefit a small subset of individuals, it may do no good to others, and it may be detrimental to other people. So our notion and our hypothesis that is now supported by a lot of data is that diet that would maintain normal blood glucose must be personally tailored. 
And why am I telling you all this on a talk that is devoted to gut microbes? Because the major factors that determine our individual response to different food, of course, include our genetics and our lifestyle. But we and others have found that th perhaps the most important factor that determine our different individual response to different multiple foods is the composition and the function of our microbes. So what do we do in this study? We enroll thousands of individuals and we collect a whole lot, uh, an unprecedented amount of data about these individuals. We basically are asking you to give us your life for a week and we collect as much data as possible, terabytes of data, on many, many aspects of your life. But the most important thing is we try to devise personally tailored algorithms that are different between each and every one of you in order to tailor personal diets that would normalize the blood glucose based on your own uh, individual parameters. So this is how it works. Um, this is an internet-based study, so uh, basically the volunteers uh, register online. And then when they start the study, we collect an unprecedented amount of data about them. We, we will perform your whole human genetics. We will perform blood tests. We perform a very detailed set of questionnaires relating to your life habits, family history, medications, you name it. We connect, connect you to a, a, a skin glucose meter which measures your, your glucose every five minutes for a whole week. And of course, we take a sample and we very deeply characterize your gut microbe composition and function using the most advanced techniques that are currently available. During the week, you are asked to, um, to really monitor your daily activities. The more you monitor, the better it is. And you do this through a, a specialized app for both the iPhone and Galaxy that we developed just for this study. And after a week, you already receive from us a very detailed mirroring of what you are and what your habits are and, and how your responses to food are. One of the things that we give you at a slightly later stage is a detailed analysis of your bacteria. At this point, it's just for your own interest, but the most important thing that is done behind the scenes once you finish your week of study is that a very large group of people at the Weizmann Institute are working with very sophisticated high throughput computation systems in order to create your personal algorithm that would predict your response to multiple thousands of foods, even foods that you never uh, were exposed to during your week of, of uh, study. And the ultimate goal is to create a personalized diet that would be just right for you and would normalize your blood glucose and, and the related complications just in your case. Now, how do we do this? Um, to simplify it, you can think of this just like um, when you go into to the net and you order books in Amazon. What happens when you order uh, five books in Amazon? Amazon starts offering you more books. How does Amazon know what to offer you? Amazon clusters you with millions of other people who hoard, which ordered the same five books that you ordered, and he assumes that the taste of these people is very similar to you, and he starts offering you books that these people also bought. And we do the same exact thing with nutrition. We cluster you um, according to the, a huge amount of data with many other people, and then we can predict that your response to different foods, even foods that you weren't exposed to, would be very similar to these people. We have so far performed this study in over 400 people. This is by far the largest prospective nutrition study in the history um, of mankind. Um, we didn't expect this, but our study became viral, and uh, only in Israel we have 2,000 people waiting uh, in line. And we have, already, we have already been able to form predictive algorithms for our participants, which we will share with them very shortly, which predict the response to foods including many thousands of foods that they never consumed with a very high level of accuracy and we keep adding the microbes, the genetics, and we expect to really get a very accurate uh, response that, that would really represent, uh, as we see, a revolution, a scientific revolution that would harness these very advanced methods into nutrition. And just to give you a, a flavor of why I think this, is, uh, this has a chance to be a big revolution, Let's take a very small piece of our study, and I would ask you, what would you expect to be your blood sugar response if you eat rice or if you eat ice cream? And I expect that you would probably guess that your response would be like one of, these, uh, one of our participants, this, this guy, um, uh, which uh, has a very shallow uh, rise in blood glucose following eating uh, rice and a very steep response after he or she eats ice cream. 
But what about these other participants that features the opposite response? And this, and this participant has a very sharp rising blood glucose when he eats rice and a very flat response when he eats ice cream. So this guy can eat as much ice cream as he wants. <laughs> okay? Now I would ask you, what would be your guess uh, of the majority of people? Would they, be this, would, would they be like this guy or like this guy? And the answer is that 65% wow. of our very large cohort are actually responding like this guy. Okay? Now this is, this is very serious because what this tells me as a physician is that when 25% of the population which are pre-diabetic come to my office and the thing that I offer them is the American Heart Association diet, I am actually driving them or most of them faster into diabetes so they, they are better off not coming to the doctor to start with, okay? <laughs> and, we are, and we are trying to, to, to really reconsider the whole thing and, and to, to study it scientifically from the root in an individualized manner in order to change this whole paradigm. Now, these studies, this study and the many other studies I've mentioned before, trying to understand the link between our microbes and very important common diseases is a very complex uh, uh, studies because it's interdisciplinary nature, in nature, um, the infrastructure is very complicated and I'm very grateful, personally grateful, uh, for the Weizmann management for believing in this, in this idea and joining us in this venture and forming at the Weizmann an unparalleled uh, infrastructure that allows us to perform all of these studies um, and this, inf this set of infrastructure under one roof exists in very few other places in the world and it includes, for example, an anaerobic facility in which we can grow some of our gut microbes. These are very spoiled gut microbes. They, they do not like oxygen and, they, and you need very special conditions in order to grow them. We have a personalized germ-free facility in which we grow thousands of these sterile mice which allow us to uh, really study the function of human microbiome in the mouse setting. We have um, high throughput systems to study the proteins and small molecules that these bugs secrete. This, this is like the language which these bugs use to communicate with us. And most importantly, we heavily rely on the, um, on the uh, Israeli National Center for Personalized Medicine that was just formed uh, at the Weizmann uh, two years ago uh, with, um, with very generous contribution from the Grant family. And this allows us, and, and, and our colleagues are very jealous of us, to really use the, the highest and the most sophisticated genomic, proteomic tools in a very fast, very collaborative manner that really makes us move very quickly forward. So I'm very thankful for that as well. But I'm most grateful for the amazing group of students and postdocs from Israel and now from four continents that have joined me in this venture in the last two years and are performing all of this uh, research. All, all this, uh, research. And um, I would like to thank them. I would like to thank uh, the generous uh, fund, funds that are supporting this uh, very complicated and costly uh, uh, set of uh, uh, projects. And I would like to thank you for your continuous support uh, of our Weizmann research. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Don't rush to eat your ice cream. You, you, might, you may belong to the 35%. <clears throat> we'll take a few questions. Okay, so the question is how can you enroll in the study? So there are good news and bad news. Uh, I'll start with the bad news. The bad news are that, um, as I told you, um, this study uh, has become viral. We've done almost nothing to promote it, but you know, uh, uh, the waiting list at the moment is a year and a half. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so the list is long. The good news is that if you are a generous Weizmann philanthropist, <laughs> you, you're on a different list. <laughs> So, so if, you're, if you're one of those, you, all you need to do is to email me, so. <laughs> so 
so uh, I'll repeat the question. The question is um, whether we will, in the future, be, be able to really simplify the way we characterize people. And that's an excellent question, and the answer is that we expect that the answer would be yes, because right now, in the first thousands of people that we, we sequence, we really want to collect as much data as possible because we need to define what normal is and, and, and to define the algorithm in, in the deepest possible way. But once we get to this point, and we're very close actually, we expect that perhaps by only doing, for example, the sequencing of the gut microbes or the genetics or maybe any other parameter, we would be able to as efficiently cluster a particular individual into the correct group without having to do all this glucose monitoring for a week and to achieve the same exact results. But the, the, the near future will tell us. Can I, uh, just a question I about, just Re what, Rega, one question about celiac disease. We've seen a huge spike in the number of diagnoses of people with celiac. Just wondering if your research is looking into that and if you've started to find some causes as far as that's concerned. Uh, can you repeat the first part of the uh, question? Celiac disease. There's been a huge increase in the number of celiac? people that have, with celiac. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Um, celiac disease, um, like several other, um, I would say, autoimmune disorders, uh, have seen a really rising prevalence of diagnosis. Um, we, as, as I told you, like in IBD and like in obesity, this rise is very quick in terms of evolution. So we don't think it is a genetically driven uh, 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 factor that's driving it. It's an environmental factor. And of the environmental factors, of course, the, the, the ecosystem of microbes within us could take place. And this is a great question uh, that we and others are uh, looking into. People now are looking into diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis uh, and their there are amazing uh, recent findings about uh, the, the um, participation of certain bugs in the pathogenesis of this disease. So for sure, this is uh, um, going to be interesting. I'm sure there are many more questions. Iran would still be with us during the whole day. And you and your bacteria can approach him and uh, ask uh, the questions. Thank you, Iran. <clears throat>